Today we celebrate dads and everything that makes them awesome. Dads are men, real men. They like their coffee black, their meat red, and their jeans blue. They are masters of the grill, the remote, and embarrassing their teenagers. They collect power tools like it's a hobby and think a vegan is something on Star Trek. But underneath that gruff exterior shell is a harder, gruffier shell. But underneath that shell is a warm, gooey, soft spot that comes with being a dad. The part that makes him tear up at episodes of Extreme Home Makeover, or become emotionally invested in his six-year-old daughter's soccer match. And though he has the fashion sense of a tourist, he's always up for an impromptu fashion show starring his little princess. Dad brings home the bacon, eats the bacon, and thankfully doesn't do much of the bacon. He can fix anything with a can of WD-40 and a roll of duct tape, or a little advice at just the right time. So today we say thank you, Dad. Thanks for all the corny jokes and the fun times. Thanks for teaching us how to build stuff, hunt stuff, fix stuff, throw stuff, play stuff, and do stuff. But most importantly, thanks for teaching us who to be. We can never repay you for all you do, but at least we got you a new tie. Happy Father's Day. And he gave them what we know as the Great Commission. He told them to go into all the world and to make more disciples. And what a disciple literally meant was a student that followed a teacher and learned what he did and did what he did. And so he was telling them, I want you, I've spent three and a half years with you and you are like me. And now I want you to go make more people like me. And we've been doing that for over 2,000 years. The second thing that we, we, uh, we learned as the principles of the new church is that they had a passion, and this passion was for evangelism and multiplication. You start with 11 guys on a mountain before you get from chapter 1 of the book of Acts to chapter 2 in the book of Acts. They've already multiplied to 120 in a room. That 120 explodes in one service to 3,120. And by the end of the chapter, you are adding to the church daily. This principle of multiplication and evangelism. But I wondered as I was preparing for this message, what did the early church say about fatherhood? If we were going to use scripture to go back into time and find out, and, and because the whole basis of the movie Back to the Future is he's got to go back to secure the, into the past to secure his future. And as we look in, at, the, at Scripture, sometimes we think that Scripture has become outdated, but it is those Scriptures and that live, living, breathing Word of God that gives us the principles of yesterday that secures our tomorrows. And I wanted to know, what is it about this fatherhood situation when it comes to Scripture? And I learned very quickly that in Scripture, fatherhood could mean two things. It could be, it mean a biological father or a positional father. And nine times out of ten, when it's talking about fatherhood, especially in the New Testament, it is talking about positional fatherhood and not biological fatherhood. And you say, well, Pastor, can you give me some examples? Absolutely. Most of us will read the Bible and think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the synoptic gospels, and you will think, man, these guys must have walked with Jesus. Do you realize that two of the four were not even disciples? It is argued that Mark never even met Jesus. He was too young. If he did, it was through the eyes of a, a young uh, boy or a teenager. Mark was a disciple of Peter. Mark wrote it as Peter told him, shepherding him, fathering him, mentoring him. You can go down the line. Barnabas was a father figure to Paul. You've got Paul turning into the father figure of Timothy and Titus. He addresses them as sons in Scripture. He deals with this principle of positional fatherhood. So I, I thought about, well, what does a father even mean by definition? And so I went to you know, our dictionary and I found out that this, and, and this was one of those key moments where the message started to come alive. It says, a father is a male parent, any male ancestor, especially founder of a race, family, or line. A progenitor. 
And I looked up, I wanted to know, well, what's a progenitor mean? I know that you probably have more vast vocabulary than I do, but there's probably two or three people, I won't ask you to say amen, that would like to know what a progenitor is. Listen to this. Serves as a model or first to indicate a direction. Hmm. A person who has originated something. Like we use the terms father of modern psychology, a father of modern science. We use the terms as this progenitor, as, as this father figure, this, this male that has, or, or this person that has come forward and said, I'm going to give us direction on where to go. I am going to take the lead. And, and the qualities, and I said, well, well, I better look up fatherhood. And it said the qualities or spirit of being a father of all those things that I read ahead. We see the early church men in leadership that were becoming fathers to churches and to others. This commitment of being a positional father comes with a cost. Fatherhood is not cheap. The cost of fatherhood uh, most of the time is not measured in how hard you work. It's measured in time. See, a lot of times we show our love as fathers in us providing for our families. And we show our love by doing, going to work, long hours. And those are important things. And I'm not telling any of you to quit going to work. Uh, your, your family needs you to continue doing that. But at the same time, your children, if, if you're a, uh, your children really don't care if you're vice president of anything. Because they'd rather have you than your position. The currency of fatherhood above all is time. And so I, I, as I was studying for this message, this thing that kind of stood out to me, I read about a study of middle America, what we would call uh, middle class family fathers, as they did a study, and this is what the study discovered. They went to each one of these fathers and they decided, we're going to ask you a series of questions. One of those questions was, how much time do you spend with your children? And I'm shocked because I think these guys were really answering honestly. I know that most of you would say, well, I spend like 72 hours a week with them. These guys come up with, I spend 15 to 20 minutes a day with my kids. So what they did is they said, okay, let's take microphones and we're going to put a microphone on you for the next 30 days and we're going to put cameras in your house and we're going to see just about these 15 to 20 minutes. We want to document this 15 to 20 minute meetings that you have with your children. And these guys agreed. And they put these cameras and these, these microphones on these men and in their homes. And they discovered that it wasn't 15 to 20 minutes. The average middle class parent, father in this study spent 37 seconds a day. 2.7 encounters with their children lasting 10 to 15 seconds an encounter. Most of them were like, go to your room. Go pick up your socks. Hey, how are you doing today? How was school? It doesn't take long to do that, does it? 37 seconds a day. How can we possibly have and direct the next generation of life? How could we possibly in 37 seconds a day be the scriptural, positional, and biological fathers that we need to be when scripture gives us mandates according to Deuteronomy? It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your hearts and with all of your souls and with all of your might. And these words that I commend to, uh, command to you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. How in the world can we tell our kids and our families and influence the next generation when the TV set and, uh, and the, the things that are of this world are now parenting our children and they are not hearing the things of the Lord from the father that is supposed to speak into their lives according to Deuteronomy he didn't say ask them how their school went yes every parent should ask how school went but it said we should teach diligently right and wrong we should teach diligently the things of God walking in the paths of righteousness why we do what we do why do we even go to church why do we sing those songs why do we sit down and pray why do we 
we pray over food? Why do we pray at the, at the end of the night? What is it about us that makes us different? Those are the positions of fatherhood that a father should be speaking over their children. And that yet, yet we are some of the first as parents. I'm a parent of two. We are the first to complain why our children go down the wrong path when we are taking 37 seconds a day and telling them about the things of life and the things of God. You say, well, Pastor, I just don't believe the study. Look at the world, man. Look at that. You, you complain about this generation. And then we know that this generation correlates with the amount of kids growing up without a father, without that progenitor directing them and giving them direction. And you say, well, that's just for, you know, that's just for the, the you know, those, those families that are, are below poverty level, that they live in those places and, and their fathers just run out on them and they did all this. No, do you realize that if the, uh, if the statistics are correct, that if you are divorced, and I'm not trying to throw stones of judgment, but if you're getting your kids every other weekend, do you realize your time has now been diminished to only two encounters when you used to have four? just the facts it's just statistics we can trace people in prison and most of them are fatherless why do you think the bible mentions it so many times care for the fatherless go and make a way for the fatherless be fathers to the fatherless why does paul address the young adults and, and, and the older adults in the new testament church of saying ladies that are of age and experience teach young women how to be ladies and fathers teach those that are fatherless how to how to be sons it's important how in the world listen to what happens when fathers are silent according to scripture <clears throat> found in the book of, of Judges. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Isn't that wonderful testimony? Woohoo! All the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord and had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died at the age of 110, and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance. And, and in Timnath Heres, in the country of Ephraim, the north of the mountain of Gaash, and all the generations also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went after their gods and among the gods of the peoples who were around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger and they abandoned the Lord and served Baals and Asherah. It's talking about there was a generation of fathers that did the job of fatherhood. Those elders and Joshua were able to give testimony and live the life before their children that caused their children to live for the Lord and to do the things of God. But in the time span between Joshua and further generations, they started living less for the Lord and more for themselves, and the testimonies in the ears of children diminished until the, father, the voice of a father becomes silent, and at the moment that voice of fathers become silent they abandon God they quit hearing about God dividing the Red Sea they quit hearing about manna falling from heaven they quit hearing about the miracles of God they quit hearing about the supernatural power of God interceding and doing things that were beyond comprehension and imagination we need fathers that are going to stand up and tell their stories. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Genesis. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the ways of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring Abraham what he has promised. The key to that hinging upon Abraham receiving the promise after Abraham has died is his command to teach it to his children and his household. If he doesn't teach his children, the promise dies. 
It has a shelf life. God told him, I want you to go and I, I, I've got good things and great things set aside for you, but go learn how to command your children and your household in doing the things of God. I want you to be able to teach it to not thousands of people. Some people say, oh, I'm not a teacher. You're, man, you're in your house every day. And the level in which you are passionate about God will be the level that your children are passionate about God, and I can prove it to you by Scripture. Here we go. It's going to get better, guys. Just hold on. 2 Kings 14, 3 and 4 says this, talking about the next king of Israel. He said, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did all the things of Joash his father had done, but the high places were not removed, and the people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. See, David was his descendant. David was like probably great-great-grandfather. And the Bible says he didn't, wasn't passionately, or his heart wasn't sold out, or his heart wasn't passionately after God. His heart was fond of God like his father. It wasn't to an extreme. It was just, it wasn't that he did evil. He just did right in a small portion. He didn't go all the way. He didn't get cold, totally committed. He only just did what his father Joash did. Joash said, well, it's enough. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to preach here for two minutes and then we're going to get busy with this thing. I love movies about history and I love movies about about valor and courage. Like when we were soldiers. I love that movie. That's one of my top five. That leadership ability, that, that courage that faces all odds, even for the sacrificing of one's life for another. I love those type of movies. But there was a movie years ago, I, I, I mean it's some years ago, called the, it was called Troy. Everybody familiar with Troy? It's that, you know, myth, you know that, that Greek story of Troy, you know, the Spartans, Troy, all of that good stuff. And how they, you know, how they made the Trojan horse and they got into Troy. And there were two main characters. Actually, there was three. There was Achilles, and he was kind of the good and bad guy. He's that guy in Greek mythology that his mother supposedly dipped him in the river Styx and she held him by the heel. And because she dipped him in the river Styx, he was invincible except for his heel. That's where we get the Achilles tendon because he was shot in the heel. And Achilles couldn't be defeated because of that because most people would not aim for the ankle or the heel when they're fighting somebody. But there was another hero, Paris... The, he, he was a young guy that was kind of a prince of Troy and he did some foolish things and he got his brother Hector involved and Hector was like the leader of the army. He was that strong guy. And, um, and, and How many of you ladies saw Troy? I wonder if it was about Brad Pitt and Hector, you know. <laughs> Achilles. I did that to you on purpose. Uh, it's Father's Day. I had to do something. <laughs> Every lady now, there. woo! I vote for Troy. Can we watch it next week, Pastor? No. But Achilles ends up killing Hector because he's fighting for his brother. But Achilles falls in love with Hector and Paris' cousin. He goes to rescue her in the middle of the fall of Troy. And Paris, thinking he's going to, to hurt her, he takes an arrow and shoots it. He's not a very good shot. Shoots Achilles in the heel and, and that makes Achilles mortal. And then he shoots him and he's about to die. And Paris is going to take the, the, what's left of, the Tro, uh, of, of Troy and he's going to take them and start all over again. And the movie kind of ends. But it ends with a statement. The voice of Achilles says these words. Let people say, I walked with giants. Men rise like the winter wheat. Rise and fall like the winter wheat. But these names will never die. Let them say I lived in the time of Hector. Let them say I lived in the time of Achilles. And, and the movie ends and you're all like, oh man, that's myth. 
there was no Achilles. That's make-believe. It's Hollywood. But the statement remains true. Because one day I'm going to stand before the Lord. And my account is going to be to Him. And I don't know about that day. I don't know what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say. But I hope that on that day that I get to have enough of my consciousness. And I, I'm probably going to be overwhelmed by the sight of God and forget everything that I've ever known. And that will be okay too. But just let me use my imagination for just a little bit. On that day, I hope that maybe I could say, I walked among giants. Men rose and fell like the winter wheat. But I lived with names like Joe Reynolds that went to the, the jail Friday night and 57 men gave their heart to the knowledge of Christ. Seven of them never have attended church in their entire life. Let me say that I lived in the time. This cat amazed me at the, on our missions trip. Steve Reed's over there throwing boxes into a... You know he's 60 years old? 6-0, throwing boxes farther than I can. And yet you'll see him in the nursery, and you'll see him in the, the preschool and the toddlers, and you'll see him walk in an elders meeting. I lived in the time of Steve Reed, the Randy Bells, the David Pleasant Seniors. I lived in the time of the Tony Flamias, the Tattoo Bobs. I lived in a time where the men of elevation stood up, and they said, we will not have our children defined by the things of the culture, but we will speak the things of the Lord over us. The Peter marriage that will walk into the bedroom of his children and his daughters and pray in the Holy Spirit over them. That is who we are. We are the mighty men of God that stand with our shoulders squared back. We are the giants among men. We are the men that can't necessarily play rock music or, or we're not going to sell a million albums or we're not going to rap and, and we're not going to, to be superstars on a basketball court. But we will stand in the gap where the Bible says, who will go for us? We, the men of Elevation, 2nd and Jackson Street, will stand firm and raise our children. Amen. Amen.